Okay, this is getting ridiculous. You need to wake up. <sighs> Whoa. Whoa, wait, what? What? What do you mean, what? You've been sleeping in this pew for two months now. I, I was sl I was sleeping for two months? Surely you must have been getting up to eat and use the bathroom, right? I mean, we've never even seen you move from that spot, but you couldn't have been asleep for two whole months. I swear I have no idea what's going on. Honestly, I can't even remember how I got here. <sighs> What's the last thing you do remember? I was killing some super strong bosses, getting tons of riches, wealth, and fame. Oh, and I was super close to becoming a master of all skills. Mm-hmm. How exactly were you doing that? The power of the relics? The relics? You haven't heard of the Shattered Relics? <sighs> no, never in my life. Oh my god. Look, all I know is you've been asleep here for two months, and we've only let you stay because we were afraid the press would have a field day if they saw us kicking a homeless guy out of the church. Enough is enough, though. You have to go. Okay, okay, I'm going. Wait, what, what was I doing before I fell asleep here? I have no clue. You were walking through the church, blowing molten glass. We still haven't repaired all the burn marks in the carpet, or picked up all the random orbs you made and dropped on the ground. Crap. What? I just realized what I was doing before I fell asleep. Training crafting? Yes. One inventory at a time. Thousands of trips. Can I go back to sleep on your pew, please? I want to go back to Shattered Relics. Get out. Okay. Get out. Get. Out. Okay. Hello, and welcome back to Time Traveling Iron Man, Episode 18. It's been a while, so if you need a reminder of our progress so far, or are just finding the series for the first time, I highly recommend starting the series from the beginning by clicking the playlist in the upper right. If not, buckle in, because we've got a huge grind ahead of us in this episode. Without further ado, let's jump back into March of 2002. And the first thing we're going to do is a quest. And that's actually to do the one quest for this month, which is Scorpion Catcher. Down by where the magic trees are that I chopped in the last episode, there's a tower, and this is actually the Sorcerer's Tower, of which Thormac the Sorcerer lives at the top. So we're gonna go have a chat with him. Pretty simply, he just requests that we go fetch his Lesser Karad Scorpions, and they've been somehow scattered all over the world. So I'm gonna have to locate them first and then go collect them. He says in return, he'll help us beef up our battle staves, which I'll talk more about later. He gives us a scorpion cage in which to catch the actual scorpions in, and then suggests that we go talk to the seers north in the village where I was chopping the ewes, and they might be able to give us clues as to where the actual scorpions are. We can chat with any of the seers in the village, and they'll be able to use their powers of foresight to be able to locate the scorpions for us. Apparently this guy is a master of animal detection in particular, so that's really useful. The seer looks into his looking glass and gives me the prophecy that I want. Apparently one is located by some nasty spiders with two coffins in there, so I have a feeling I know where that is. So let's go ahead and fetch that one first. Once again, we return to this ominous ladder in the middle of the scorched earth to venture down into the Talvary Dungeon, where we will locate the Scorpion, and this time I'm more properly equipped as I've brought my Anti-Dragon Shield. <laughs> All the way in the very back of the dungeon, there's a secret room. It's actually just past the Poison Spiders as well, so I did remember to bring my Anti-Poison this time, just in case they managed to get a poison off on me. So right around the corner here, there's an odd wall. You can search it, and you go right into this mysterious room with a torture rack in it, which is kind of scary but somehow the scorpion found its way in here and here it is. If I try to just pick it up, it stings me, which kind of sucks, but 
I can use the cage on it and collect it. And now we have one scorpion. Let's go back and talk to the seers and find out where the second one is. Telling the seer that we retrieved the scorpion from the Talbury dungeon, he looks back into his looking glass and finds the second scorpion in a little village to the east, surrounded by lots of uncivilized looking warriors. Seems like they've stashed it away there thinking it was an interesting thing they might be able to sell and I'm gonna have to go basically steal it back. He also gives me information on the last scorpion, which is pretty nice, as it's in some sort of upstairs room with a lot of brown clothing lying around. I think I know where that last one is, so let's start with that one first, and then we'll come back from the middle one. So a room upstairs surrounded by brown clothing immediately communicates to me that they're talking about the prayer guild. So let's go upstairs and check out for that scorpion. And sure enough, hiding in the corner over here is the second scorpion. So let's go ahead and grab it, throw it into the cage, and we've got the second one. However, the third one is not going to be super easy. There's a bit of a problem, and I'll take you through that now. So basically, it's located in the Barbarian Outpost, which used to be located to the south of the Sears Village, kind of near the tower that you need to infiltrate for the Merlin's Crystal Quest, but now it got moved way to the east on top of the Baxatorian Falls. This is a problem for me because that entire region was not yet added to the game, and now I need to go over there. So I'm actually going to take the exception here, as this falls under my changed but existing content rule, where I can complete existing content that was changed in a way that makes it uncompletable, even if it requires me to go to areas or use items or do things that didn't exist yet. This is a pretty minor exception to take, and I feel like the reward of getting the battle staff upgrade from this quest is worth it. So we're going to venture over to the unexplored land of the Baxatorian Falls and get this part of the quest done. So let's begin our journey into areas yet unexplored, yet cannot be explored yet. That was a weird way to say that. Here we are in Hemnister, which does not exist yet. We'll be traveling past the Tree Norm Stronghold, which also does not exist yet. This is uh, quite the adventure, that's for sure. And here we are. A lot of music tracks later that I should not have. We're at the gate of the Barbarian Outpost. So let's go ahead and talk to the guards and see if we can get in and get that scorpion. Unfortunately, they say only barbarians are allowed. So I need to prove myself as a barbarian to be able to get into the outpost. And unfortunately, I have to prove my worth by completing a bar crawl, interestingly enough. I guess the only thing that makes you rugged and tough is your ability to stomach alcohol. That said, this is another unfortunate part where I need to take an exception. When the bar crawl first came out, it obviously only included bars that existed at the time, but in the RuneScape to swap over, it was expanded to include a lot of different locations that also did not exist. Most notably, it includes a Gnome Stronghold, Yanil, and Ardoin bar, which are in areas that I would not otherwise be able to access. But as with coming up here to the outpost at all, I am going to actually complete the bar crawl by going to all of these locations. Again, it's a pretty small exception as I'm just walking somewhere, I'm not interacting with anything else there, and it's not benefiting the account in any other way. So here we are with the first exception of many. I need to enter the Tree Gnome Stronghold for the first time. None of you people exist, please stop talking to me. But in actuality, I can't really ignore Femi here. You're always requested to help them move these boxes into this cart before you go in. So I'll just go ahead and help them and get it out of the way. It plays a very minor role in a future quest, so it's not a huge deal. And here's the first stop on our exception list, and that's Blueberry's Bar here in the Tree Gnome Stronghold tree. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the bar crawl challenge here and we'll get going. And I forgot my money, crap. All right, trying again. We're gonna do the fire toad blast here. Let's take the drink and uh, get the side card sign to hurt me, I guess. I, I, that, that was weird. And here's the second exception, the winged horse in? I don't know what that is. But here we do the heart stopper ale, which we'll take a drink of and it hits me for a 16. Wow. Does anyone know if you can die from drinking this? Has anyone ever been lured doing the Alfred Grimham bar crawl? <laughs> I wonder if that's possible. That'd be really funny. And our final stop and exception is the Red Dragon Inn here in Yanil. Let's go ahead and grab the beer here and keep moving on. And that's the fire brandy, which is apparently set on fire before it's served to me. Let's go ahead and move on. Our next stop is back in a familiar area, and that's the Jolly Boar Inn, which is Old Suspicious, which we drink, and that's it. Nothing too fancy here, uh, except I'm starting to get a little drunk. Also, fun fact, did you know that 
pretty much all of the pubs in RuneScape have a unique sign correlating to the name of the pub. Like this is the Wild Boar Inn, and it has a wild boar for a sign. It's pretty nifty. Keep an eye out for it next time you're walking around the game. All right, next up, we have the Blue Moon Inn in Barak, another very iconic location. And we gotta pay 50 gold for some gut rot. Ugh. Why do you have to drink this stuff? It's so nasty. Next up, next up is a stop here in the Rising Sun Inn in Falador. And we're gonna drink the Hand of Death cocktail. <laughs> I don't wanna do this anymore. Oh no. All right, next up is the Rusty Anchor in Port Sarim for a Black Skull Ale. That actually sounds like something a microbrewery near me would make. And it would probably be like super dark and super high alcohol content but overall really good and refreshing. Glad to have that one. Next up is the Karamja Spirits Bar here in Karamja, of course. I hope it's gonna be some Karamja rum. I've always wanted to try some. It's eight bite liquor. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, I'm getting, <laughs> I get pretty wasted, man. Oh my God. All right, next up is the Dead Man's Chest here in Brimhaven. It's gonna be some old super grog. Oh, interesting. Uh, it wasn't too bad, I guess. And our very last stop is the Forester's Arms here back in the Sears Village. And they're gonna serve us some liver bane. Oh god, I can feel that right in my liver. And now we're actually too drunk to even read our bar crawl card. <laughs> This is more than I've ever drank in my life. I'm so freaking drunk. I saw this guy at like three bars that I was also at, and now he's also walking in sync with me to go turn in the bar crawl. <laughs> what are the chances? All right, turning in the bar crawl, and now we have access to the Barbarian Outpost. I'm not going to request to be able to smash my vials yet, as that was a feature that did not exist. And it's actually really convenient, so I don't want to take advantage of it until it's actually released. And thanks to that, we can now enter the actual outpost. And right inside this one little cell here is where the scorpion is located, hiding in the corner just like the others. Let's go ahead and scoop it up in the cage, and we'll be on our way to turn these back into Thormac. And here we go. Turning in the scorpions back to Thormac completes the quest, which gives us a lot of strength experience, which is really nice. Interesting that that's the reward as well. So now we have the ability to upgrade Battle Staffs, which are a new magic weapon released this month here with Thormac. But it's not going to be quite that simple, and I'll address that later. But for now, let's move on to the next part of the episode. So of course, the main focus of today's episode is getting up to that level 80 crafting. I put it off to this month as I knew there was a crafting expansion coming out this month, and if I were to do it last month when the glory was actually released, the grind would have looked identical to the one that you saw in July of last year. However, it would have been about twice as long, as I need about twice as much experience to go from 70 to 80 as I did from 1 to 70 basically, or 50 to 70 I guess I did. So in order to get there, I want to explore some of the new crafting methods that came out with this crafting expansion and see which is the fastest one and which one we should take advantage of. The first one I want to explore is actually the crafting guild. There's a couple different methods I could do in here. Also, technically this guild did exist as of last month, so I could have done these methods last month as well, but we'll see if they're any good. First thing I want to do is start with mining clay and processing it right here, as everything you need to process the clay is available right here. So let's check that out. Okay, I only did about two inventories here, but as you can see, I'm evening out around 8k experience an hour. If you're wondering why I'm ending with a full inventory of clay, it's because the experience counter didn't start tracking until I actually got crafting experience, so that first inventory of clay did not count towards the total time. So this equals out. It's actually a lot worse than I expected, as I was getting around four to 6K an hour, depending on how focused I was with the West Varrock method. And this is all in one really close knit loop. The main problem is that the bronze pickaxe takes so long to mine clay, it's over three seconds or seven ticks per clay, no matter what I do. Physically mining the clay is just so much of the time and there's no way to speed that up. If I had a better pickaxe, I bet this would be much better. But unfortunately, I don't think this is going to be the option just because it's not that great. 
Also, this actually includes the bonus experience that I get from crafting bowls, as it's a new item that was released with Dragon Slayer. And it's actually quite a bit better experience per item than pie dishes, so that goes to show you just how unuseful this method actually is, unfortunately. Now, there is also a lot of silver and gold rocks here, and those would be pretty useful, but due to the same issue with just having a bronze pickaxe, I don't think they're going to be any better than last July, where I was getting around 6 to 7k experience an hour mining silver and banking it, then smithing and smelting it as normal. And the other thing is, while there's more rocks here than at Varak West, and I wouldn't have to world hop, I would still need to teleport back to Falador and bank, and I think the actual banking loop is actually going to be longer than West Varrock. So in actuality, that method hasn't received any buff at all. I do have a really good source of gold rocks here, which is notable, but the problem with gold is it actually gives less experience per item and takes longer to get than silver. So realistically, these gold rocks are not going to be incredibly useful. And of course, if you're wondering, there is of course a bank chest here in the crafting guild, but I obviously cannot use that, even if I want it to, I would need to do the Fodor Hard Diary to get access to it, or just have 99 crafting, which defeats the whole purpose of this goal, and also I'd have to teleport like 16 years in the future. However, there is still one other method I want to investigate here at the Crafting Guild, and that's actually killing cows and then tanning the hides here, as that can all be done in one contiguous loop here as well. So let's test that out next. Surprisingly, this one is not as good as I thought. It's about seven and a half thousand experience per hour once you factor in the time to collect all the cow hides. I could probably do it a little bit faster if I had actually brought my magic short bow and arrows, but even then, I don't think you're pushing more than 10k experience an hour, so I'm going to cap this around eight and we'll go from there. The main problem with it is that I'm actually capped at only crafting leather bodies, which are not super great. If I could craft something like a hard level leather body or a coif, it'd probably be better. But these are only 25 experience each. And that's about all that we can do here at the crafting guild, unfortunately. But we still have one more method yet to explore. So let's go check that one out. Need a quick stop here at the general store just to buy some buckets. And here we are. This is where we're going to explore the final crafting method for March of 2002. We're of course going to take the boat to Entrana, and you probably know what I'm up to. First thing we're going to do is actually collect a bunch of sand from the sand pit here. And then in this house here, there's a glass blowing pipe conveniently located that we can take and use. And then at the very northwestern point of Entrana, there's a bunch of seaweed spawns here. There's not going to be enough that I can collect all of my inventory full before having to world hop, so I will have to world hop one time here when collecting seaweed, but that's no big deal. It's also worth noting that I could get seaweed from big net fishing, but it's actually super uncommon, and it would take me a lot of big net fishing in order to get all the seaweed I need. It's about a 4% chance to get seaweed from that, so it's better for me just to pick it up here at the northwestern tip of Entrana. It's actually pretty interesting. Other than fishing, this was literally the only place to pick up seaweed in the game in RuneScape Classic. There wasn't even any spawns on the Karamja. Next, we take a stop back in the house where we stole the glass blowing pipe and use the range to cook our seaweed into soda ash. Funnily enough, when I first started theorizing this grind, I didn't think there was a range on Entrana at all. I couldn't find any source that claimed there was. But since then, the Ars Classic wiki has been updated to show that there is a range on Entrana. It's not entirely clear where it is located, but I'm just going to use this one since it's most convenient and I can't determine where it is otherwise. I initially thought I'd have to bring logs and make fires on Entrana to cook my soda ash, so I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore. And then conveniently enough, there's a range located here for us to smelt our sand and soda ash into molten glass. And then while walking back to the seaweed for more, we can blow our glass into unpowered orbs. And this is actually one of the reasons why this method is going to be so good. It's because these orbs give so much more experience per item than almost anything else I have access to. Whereas leather gives about 25 per item, clay about 20, these give 60 per item. And that's where a lot of my experience per hour is going to come from. Unfortunately, there's only three items I can craft. Beer glasses, vials, and unpowered orbs. So unpowered orbs are going to be the best item I can make. They are also extremely useful to have on the account as I'll be able to use them to craft battle staffs later. However, banking them is going to be a huge problem. I'll probably make a few trips to the bank to bank some so I can have them for later, but I'm really not going to need that many and it'll be a lot faster for me just to drop them on my way back to the seaweed. So that's what I'll be doing. 
So next, let's do a couple rotations of this and get a feel for how fast the experience is. So as you can see here, we're leveling off right of around 12k experience an hour, maybe a little bit more if I really focus, but that's significantly better than any other method we've seen so far. Actually pretty much double some of the other methods. Oh, that's really good. Of course, this does have the downside that it produces literally nothing for the account except for crafting experience. Like I said, I will be banking some of these, but that's going to be slowing it down by an intense amount. So I won't be banking very many. I'll be able to make more in the future a little faster. So let's recap all the methods we've gone over so far and break them down in terms of hours. If I wanted to mine silver, I'd be looking at about a 225 hour grind, but it would provide a lot of passive mining and smithing experience. Actually 900k mining experience and 300k smithing experience, which is not a small amount and would be extremely nice for the account. The holy symbols would also give me up to a, about 450,000 extra cash, but I'm actually not that worried about the cash as we just did the massive Yu Longbow grind and we should be set for cash for a long time. If I wanted to stick with clay, I'd get about 7k experience an hour, so better than just the silver, but that's still going to take about 160 hours and it really only gives me about 170k mining experience in return, which isn't great. Killing cows for leather is actually a pretty interesting option because it'll take about 150 hours, but I'll also get about one and a half million experience in my combat skills, which could be really useful. However, I'm also not super interested in getting it as at some point I'll be getting a lot of combat experience in the future from other grinds. So I'm not super concerned with getting that now. Now we also can't forget about the previous method that I was using in the last couple of episodes, which is actually picking flax and spinning it into bowstrings. Unfortunately, this is a completely lackluster method for just pure crafting experience, as I was averaging about 4.5k experience per hour during that grind, which means that it's going to take me about 250 hours if I decide to go this route. It is worth noting that I would have bowstrings for basically forever, and I might be able to speed it up a little bit if I didn't actually bank the bowstrings, but even with that included, it's definitely not worth going this route. And then finally, the glass blowing method that you just saw should only take about 90 hours to gain the total experience needed for 80. The major downside of doing the glass blowing method is it gets me literally nothing in terms of passive progress. However, because it's nearly half the time of any of the other methods, that's the method I'm going to be choosing to go with. It's going to be a heck of a grind anyway, so I'm glad to cut out many, many hours. I already spent almost 150 hours going for 70 crafting before, so I'm not very interested in doing that level of grind again. Now you might be wondering why I've left out battle staff crafting from this list, and there's a very important reason for that. A couple years back, Jagex made a bot integrity update where they locked Zaf's battle staff stock behind the wet lies below quest. This means that I am effectively locked out of buying any battle staves as Zaf staff is the only place to obtain them at this point in the account. I could technically use my changed content exception to get around this and try to do what lies below, but what lies below is a huge exception of a quest that would result in me needing to train runecrafting, a skill I don't even have, so I'm going to take a pass on this one. So unfortunately this is it for now. I'm basically just going to be walking back and forth crafting unpowered orbs and gaining that crafting experience. This is going to take some time, but I'm hoping to be able to do it during downtime while working on other accounts, so we'll see how things go. This is also pretty interesting because I'm effectively being an ultimate Iron Man once again. Kind of weird how you were expected to train crafting back in the day. There exists another human on Entrana. Very much. It's amazing. I found a friend. I thought I'd be alone here forever, but there's someone here. There we go, 75 crafting. Now I don't normally do updates every level, but I feel like I need to just to keep myself going for this grind. This level literally took me like 8 hours from 74 and it's only going to get worse from here. No major unlocks at 75 for me unfortunately. Some unlocks for down the road though. But more importantly, I have some really important news. I discovered that if a door is closing on you a lot, one that you need to go through, such as to get to this range, I have to go through this door every time. If you open and close the door a lot until it gets stuck, it'll stay open for twice as long. So now I can do a whole trip without having to open it again. Yeah, I, I think I'm going kind of insane. And a straight almost 10 hours later, 76 crafting. My god. Well, at least we have a brand new level, and to celebrate, let me walk you through my tier list of my favorite bushes on Entrana. 
The Bush by the Well. Pleasantly located, aesthetically pleasing layout-wise, not in my path at all. I'd give it a B. This Bush by the Law Altar. Conveniently placed, reminds me when I need to make my turn to go to the seaweed. I'll give it an A. This bush here by the bombed out building, I'll give it a C. It's kind of out of place, it doesn't look very great, and it's not very useful. These bushes by the wall of the church. They're perfectly accenting the church wall, they look wonderful, and they're definitely out of my way. I give these ones an S. This bush by the house I cooked the seaweed in. It's in my way, it's annoyingly positioned, and I get stuck all the time behind it. I'm giving this one a flat F. These bushes behind the garden of that house. If I could put these in the dirt, I absolutely would. These are so horribly positioned that I literally want to put them in hell. If they weren't here, my trip time would be literally a quarter of what it is. Oh my god, why are these bushes even here? Please, please, someone take them away. And there we go, 77 crafting obtained. Believe it or not, this is actually still only just under 60% of the way from 70 to 80 crafting, which means I still have about 35 hours of this crafting method to go. It is slow, monotonous going, but it is going, and I'm gonna keep at it till we get there. Also, if you've noticed this tile every time I come to the sand pile, this is actually one of the benefits of joining the channel as a member. If you join at the RS2 or OSRS tier, you can actually just contact me, let me know what tile you'd like marked in the game with your name, and I will mark it. And every time I pass that area in game in a video, you'll see your tile. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely consider joining the channel as a member. It supports me a lot and I'd be forever grateful. Just like Peepo Time here who has stolen this tile right by the sand pit that you've seen probably hundreds of times already in this video. Or at least I have. And there we go, another level achieved. 78 crafting, just two to go, thank God. So I'm gonna mix things up a little bit and you might be wondering why I'm walking back to the dock. And that's actually that I want to bank a good number of these unpowered orbs. So I figured I should start doing that now if I'm ever gonna do it at all. As I explained before, as useful as it would be, I'm locked out of battle staff crafting due to those unpulled integrity changes that happened much, much, much later on. And that's really unfortunate. But I still feel like when I do get access to battle stabs, I'm going to really want to craft some. They're such good money and such good crafting experience that it's going to be extremely beneficial to actually go through the work of doing it. So having some unpowered orbs in the bank will help a lot in that process because I'll be able to charge them up and craft them into battle stabs when I can. Unfortunately, it is a massive walk to the bank. I have to walk all the way to the Draenor Bank every time I want to deposit these. This is the closest bank to Lantrana, and I will be doing them 13 at a time. I am only going to go for a thousand though, so it shouldn't take too horribly long, and that should be a good amount to keep me going for a while. This is actually the first time I've seen the inside of my bank in like three months, and at first I didn't recognize it, which is kind of surprising. Also unfortunately, I am out of bank space, so I'm going to have to find something to drop. There's a couple good candidates in here though. And 10 hours later, another 10 hours, it's always 10 hours, I don't know why it's been 10 hours between every update, 1000 orbs in the bank. Honestly, this part hasn't been too bad at all. I really can't complain. Just the aspect of looking at this number go up has provided me with a little bit more motivation versus just dropping them on the ground and watching the experience hopelessly go up. That said, I'm definitely not going to continue banking anymore as for the reasons I've said before, they're not going to be all that useful. But it did give me a good chunk of experience, about 70 to 80k or so just banking those. Overall though, it does cut the total experience per hour by about a third, which is definitely a huge impact. So I'm going to be wrapping this up just by dropping orbs on the ground. Definitely glad to have this part of the grind done though. I will see you in a little bit for probably level 79. Oh man, look at that. After all this time of carrying around this egg just as an inventory spacer, it finally rotted. I guess I have a rotten egg now in my inventory. That's kind of nifty. I suppose if you carry around the same egg for three months, you'll get a rotten egg. Go figure. There we go. The final level up before the final one. That is 79 crafting all done. Unfortunately, even though this is a huge milestone, we are still just under 200k experience away from level 80, which means I have about 15 to 20 hours of crafting still left to do. If we had access to any boost, even a plus one, it would save so much time. But unfortunately, no such thing exists at this point in the game mode. In other news, our little friend the beaver here actually has a name now. 
Yeah, actually, thanks to Killer912 who provided the suggestion that we name the beaver Paradox, which I absolutely love. I think it's a perfect name and it perfectly exemplifies exactly what the beaver is to this account. Come on, little Paradox, let's go get a little bit more seaweed. Okay, believe it or not, as you can see by the tracker in the upper left, this is the end of our time on Enchrana. I can't believe we finally made it to this point. With this molten glass in my inventory, I will be able to get the level 80 crafting that I need. Oh, it has been a heck of a journey, but we are finally there. Let's gather a couple more things together and let's go get this crafting level and craft these amulets. Because I got some key halves from Chaos Druids and Hobgoblins, I actually can make one more crystal key, which will give me one more dragon stone. And unfortunately, that dragon stone also didn't give me any additional loot. Just a dragon stone. I didn't know that was possible. All right, the whole crew came out to to see the uh, the monumental achievement that is this 80 crafting. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get this done. Let's go ahead and cut the dragon stones, and that should award 80 crafting. Boom! Now we can go ahead and craft these amulets. <laughs> Appreciate everyone coming out. Two Dragonstone Amulets, because I do have two Dragonstones, which is amazing. Throw on the um, Balls of Wool. And then let's go ahead and enchant these guys. One and two. Two Amulets of Glory. Let's go ahead and throw those guys on. All the stats. We got it all. <laughs> Incredible. Of course, we are not quite done yet. We need to make a stroll over to the Heroes Guild and charge these guys up. So I actually forgot to make note of this location in the Heroes Guild episode, and that's the basement of the Heroes Guild, which actually has runite rocks, which is pretty interesting. But more importantly, it has this fountain of heroes here, at which we can use our newly obtained Amulets of Glory on and get charged Amulets of Glory. These are actually going to be amazing, because not only will they give me additional gems while mining, I'll be able to teleport around the game to places I can't get to normally. Mostly Edgeville and Draenor Village are the ones I'm really excited to have teleports to. Definitely a huge unlock for the account, and I'm super happy to have it. So, a quick chat about the best-in-slot amulets. The Amulet of Glory is actually going to wind up replacing two of my amulets. The Amulet of Magic also only gives a plus 10 magic bonus, and the Amulet of Power gives less in every single stat than the Amulet of Glory. So I'll be able to fully replace both of these amulets, Amulet of Power and Amulet of Magic, with the Amulet of Glory, which is amazing. So I'm just going to go ahead and high-elk these amulets. It is uh, incredible how long it took me to get these, and I no longer need them. And then of course, we can finally go ahead and drop our glass blowing pipe, and unfortunately, our rotten egg. It has been with us for the last 100 or so hours. It went from a perfectly pristine egg, and now it is a rotten egg. Goodbye, old friend. Farewell in the afterlife. So there is actually still one thing left for us to do this month, and it's actually to cast Fire Wave. The wave spells were fully released this month, which means we have a level 75 spell that we can cast. And unfortunately, we'll need one of the new runes that you can get, which is a blood rune, in order to cast this. This is the big reason why we got 72 magic in the previous episode, so we didn't have to worry about grinding that out this time. But thankfully, it is a 1 in 64 drop from the Dark Wizards here at the Circle, so it shouldn't take too long to get. I'll see you back when I have a blood rune. Wow, that was incredibly fast. I got it in 18 kills. Super nice. Two blood runes. Let's go cast this spell. All right, and here we are, the very end of our journey through March of 2002. This is incredibly exciting. With the power of a wizard's mind bomb, we can go ahead and cast Fire Wave, the new most powerful spell in the entire game, and hit a seven. Pretty cool. I'm gonna go ahead and cast it again because I don't want to carry around one random blood rune with me. Yeah, and I hit a six. Not that exciting, I guess. And there you have it. The end of March of 2002. Of course, we can't go without summarizing what we've accomplished this month. It was two items, the Magic Shortbow and the Amulet of Glory. That was an intense amount of grinding for two very consequential items, but only two of them. Having a look at the playtime for this month, it is ridiculous. At the end of the last month, I was only at 23 days playtime, which means this month on its own was 344 hours of playtime. That was such an intense grind. I am beyond ready to get moving on and move on to April of 2002. 
We do have another grind ahead of us, but it shouldn't be nearly as bad and it should be pretty interesting along the way. Thank you so much for joining me in this journey of March of 2002 and I hope you'll join me for that one as well. And of course we can't go without thanking the members of the channel. Your support means so much and allows me to keep making these videos. And an extra huge thank you to our top tier supporters, Killer912, Peepo Time, and Two on Pendrag. Thank you so much. That's it for me today though. Take care and I will see you in the next one.